This is the Story Punks podcast, the show where we talk about all the punks. So steampunk, diesel punk, cyberpunk, and all the other punks. Today is part two of my discussion with Jessica Sundin about Paolo Bacigalupi's work, The Wind Up Girl. So as I mentioned in the last intro, I'm going to keep this intro really short, a little different than when I do a two-part interview. And that's just because I know there's some people that weren't able to join these episodes. Maybe they hadn't read the book. Maybe the trigger warnings were appropriate for them and they decided to opt out. So for that reason, I'm just going to cut to the chase and get right to the rest of our discussion. I'm so excited to talk about more themes and some of the other observations we had about this intense, but very rewarding, very meaningful book. So here we go. I feel like we're kind of pointing to theme here and how some of the theme, especially with JD, I felt like he was talking a lot about, how, you know, how everything's transitory and how he, mm-hmm. through all these experiences, he's realizing how everything is, you know, the whole Buddhist philosophy and other, other Eastern philosophies about non-attachment and things like that. So do you want to talk yeah. about anything along those lines? <laughs> about the or life death any and themes. <laughs> yeah, or any themes. Because, yeah, I feel like you've brought up several themes so far, like life death, you know, shadow and light, things like that. Well, I think they definitely showed the karma, the karma, you know, going through the story several times. And um, uh, J.D. is definitely one of them that they show that with. And um, and Kanya as well, but I think mostly with with Amiko because she's considered infertile, so she cannot produce life. And, and then that kind of it goes back to the seed companies, the calorie men and the calorie companies, and how they create these infertile seeds, and so people have to buy from them every year in order to plant. But the trade off is, um, you know, they're they're sub, they're semi plague resistant. You know, they they feed where the natural seeds that they have banked away have not. Um, so they're constantly gene ripping and trying to find more solutions to this problem. And um, so, yeah, I think with the whole, the, the karma, it, definitely they showed it in the seeds and then with Amico and then playing that out with the monks and the ministry or the environmental ministry and yeah. how they're doing, you know, one was life, one was death, one was rebirth. And constantly showing that in motion. Yeah. And I thought it was really interesting that point where we learned about her, um, her sensei in the past and how she was conditioned Mm -hmm. and she's reflecting back on it. I think it's the scene where she spills the rice and has this breakthrough, like, oh my gosh, I'm not going to serve anymore, you know? And, Mm -hmm. but she thinks back on her sensei and she thinks, okay, the sensei introduced me to a god that I cannot pronounce the name, <laughs> but, um, and <laughs> she was taught that, that the she, the wine. <laughs> yeah, she remembered uh, that the sensei trained her, if you are good enough in your next life, you will reincarnate as a whole person, as a real person. And so she's all mm-hmm. along conditioned that she is less than, that she's on a cycle that's not reproductive to recreate what she already is that she's going to be reborn as a completely different thing. And um, that's really interesting, especially once you think about the ending. Um, Mm -hmm. It's funny to think about, like, is that her reincarnation without dying? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. The way that it's kind of alluding that the ending is going to go. So, Mm -hmm. yeah, with with the supposed God of... Right. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, and all of the characters, I mean, most of them are motivated for their next life. All of them, yeah. except for Anderson and Carlisle. They're, they're yeah. the only ones who weren't. They're like, this is the only life I got. So I'm going to, I'm going to do what I can where everybody else is like, I need to, I need to prepare for the next life. I need to, you know, have good karma. It was just this constant conversation, this constant rhetoric and it motivated them. Yeah. And I thought it was so interesting when, they were talking about killing Cheshire's and one of Mm -hmm. the characters, I can't remember which character it was, but he had been commissioned to be a poisoner of Cheshire's. And he said, I've killed like six people, but I've killed thousands of Cheshire's. And that's why I can't rest is because I killed the Cheshire's. 
And I really thought about that a lot. Do you have an idea about that? Because I don't, I don't totally, I'll admit. Like, why would he feel guilty about killing these Cheshires who are, you know, like this other mm-hmm. thing that's beyond, you know, true life or whatever? They're, and he doesn't feel bad. And he even says, I feel like my family contracted the disease because I killed so many Cheshires, not people. Mm-hmm. That was so weird to me, but I I also found it compelling, but I almost, I just wondered if you came across any thoughts about that. Yeah, I think that was some chai, again. It probably that, that was. That from the quote that we read earlier. Yeah, why it brought it back to I knew it was yeah. Heidi, but I didn't know, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I read that, and it, it did make me go, huh, that's interesting. And I yeah. think part of it is, perhaps pity because the creature cannot help that it was made, but oh, humans can help. Their own behavior. And so for yeah. him, he doesn't by taking out people who are behaving poorly, who don't deserve to have good karma. Um, whereas the Cheshires are innocent. They couldn't help that they were made. See, this is why I have Jessica on the show with me because <laughs> I honestly was really perplexed about that. And that's exactly the kind of thing I would bring up in a real book club or an in-person book club is like, what, what did this mean? Yeah. So thank you. I think that's what it means. I don't know. (laughs) Yeah, no, that's great. And if anybody has a comment, like their input on that, feel free. And again, it's never required. I'm just going to keep inviting you. So um, feel free. (laughs) So, okay. I would love to, I'm just keeping an eye on the time. There's so much we could, I just like prepped and prepped for this because there's so much. And then I should have known that there's just, we don't have time to go through as much as we want to. Um, So before I get to a last point that I want to talk about, is there a certain quote that you sent me that you'd love for me to focus on now or just any other point? Ooh, I know it's a big question. um, Yeah, I love the quote. Well, there's two quotes that really spoke to me. And one is by, I, I know I'm not saying his name right, is it J, J.D.? J.D.? I think it's J.D., um, but I find myself J-D. saying J.D. I don't know, even yeah. though I know it's J.D. Yeah. It's J- okay, J.D. Um, the quote that he talks about where everything is change. Oh, yeah. And that, that suffering, um, that that really spoke to me quite a bit. Um, because I think the suffering, I, I, I don't have the quote in front of me. Yeah. But, um I'll bring no, it up and then I really loved the quote by Gibbons. Yeah, even though Gibbons was so vile, the scientist Gibbons yeah. at the end, um, he was mm-hmm. also where some of my favorite quotes came from. So, uh, yeah. So um, we should all be wind ups by now. It's easier to build a person impervious to blister rust than to protect in an earlier version of the human creature. A generation from now, we could be well suited for our new environment. Your children could be the beneficiaries, yet you people refuse to adapt. You cling to some idea of humanity that evolved in concert with your environment over millennia, and which you now perversely refuse to remain in lockstep with. Mm-hmm. So that one? Yeah. Yeah. We can just jump really, to this. Like, like reincarnation right there. Yeah. He took all the stories of reincarnation and just like, boom, right there in a single quote. Where, where he's trying to say that you keep saying reincarnation is good, but this reincarnation is bad. Like becoming something that is adaptable, something that resists all the things that, that plagues you, all the things that's killing your environment, that's bad. You want to cling to the old world. You want to cling to the old traditions. And um, you keep saying that you're reincarnating into something better, but we're getting worse. We're not getting better. Um, so, yeah, I really liked that quote because I think in scientific terms, he kind of, that's what he was um, summarizing. Yeah. For I can't remember if he was saying that to Kanye. I think he was saying that to Kanye. I can't remember. Yes, I think he was saying this to Kanye, and then some of my other mm-hmm. quotes were to Amiko. Yeah. You're right. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it's really interesting to think about this on Earth Day and to think mm-hmm. about, of course, our day. I, I, it's really interesting that this world was created as an after effect or as a consequence of what people have mm-hmm. done. It's not necessarily, you know, the trying to stop something from happened, happening only. Mm-hmm. It's something has already happened and we're dealing with the fallout of that. Um, so it's really, without being too preachy, 
I think Bachi Kalupi really was able to make people think. It made me think a lot. Yeah, about, me too. Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. And then there's this other one that's really similar, similar to this. And here we go. It says, limitations can be stripped away. The safeties are there because of lessons learned, but they are not required. Some of them even make it more difficult to create you. And so this is where he's talking to Amiko. Mm -hmm. Um, Nothing about you is inevitable. He smiles. Someday, perhaps all people will be new people and you will look back on us as we now look back at the poor Neanderthals. So Mm -hmm. he's such a weirdo because (laughs) he is so (laughs) gross in so many ways. I shouldn't even say it that Mm -hmm. way. That's like judgmental. But but yeah, I I found him super vile. (laughs) But then he, <laughs> yeah, be honest, yeah. But as far as when Amiko, <laughs> one of those villains him, that you can't help but love, <laughs> right? Right, right. And he makes a lot of good points, you mm-hmm. know. So, yeah. Was there anything else you wanted to add to that? Um, uh, to the characters and to the quotes and themes. Just uh, yeah, sorry, just to that quote in particular. But yeah, you can oh you can no, whatever you'd like to. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it was brilliant. It was it was definitely in my top five quotes for sure. And you know, I think about now. It's like we we look back at other humans from different decades, even from different centuries, and we think about, you know, oh, they didn't have electricity. They just didn't know. Look at how hard they had it. And you know, <laughs> and I think now, like, what if we did become transhuman? What if we did become part android? You know, all those all those um, amenities that we would get where like where he talks about being more disease resistant, where being healthy, having longer lives that are more meaningful as a result mm-hmm. and um, having better purpose. And so, you know, he spins it so that it sounds positive. Obviously, we know what happens because, you know, that was the point of wind ups to begin with. And then we have Amigo. So we know that not all humans treat their creations as kindly as they should. And I think that that, you know, to bring that back to Earth Day, <laughs> that is certainly true as well. We don't treat our own environment, um, whatever that may be, as well as we should. We're very demanding creatures. We like our comfort. And um, sometimes, you know, when, when that doesn't happen, we just get, we get destructive without realizing it. And I think, you know, there's a lot of points in the Wind Up Girl that talk about exactly that how we want our comforts and when we don't get it we get destructive we get angry um we lash out yeah. and um then and then we then solve our problem and then we have the result of of what we solved and then we're like you're still not good enough we're still better than you even though we're the ones full of faults and you're the ones who are better than us because we made you better than us you know we <laughs> you know we just continue the cycle and so i think that quote certainly pulls that all in and I think that works very well for Earth Day too. There, I think I should get it all in there. (laughs) I think you did. Like that was impressive, Jessica. Um, Just to to share one other quote about when Amiko is realizing her strength and kind of breaking away. Uh, This was, um, for some reason, I did write the chapter on this one, chapter 29. But um, just when she started talking about herself as optimal, and how optimal in her own way. So I won't read the whole quote, but she basically, it's where she's cleaning up the rice and she just says, like, um, if, if, you know, Anderson wants someone, wishes rice cleaned off the floor, there are others to do as dirty work. She is something else, something different, optimal in her own way. And mm-hmm. it's just, it's interesting how then in another passage way earlier than this, it talked about how Anderson was looking at her and thinking, wow, she's not made for this world. Like, she's not going to survive. I'm looking at something that's going to perish in this environment because she would overheat, literally. But also just her entire makeup wasn't supposed to be part of that world and um, that the world would destroy it. But then to have her persevere and to have the creation that, you know, man had made Mm -hmm. persevere and, and then at the very end when... She's talking to her God, supposedly, uh, or as the scientist would like himself to be called, uh, given. (laughs) Yeah, like, it's just really interesting to think about everything you just talked about, the ramifications of creation and 
and how our mm-hmm. our best and worst selves come out in those mm-hmm. in those times. So, okay, cool. Did I leave uh, any? Now you had mentioned this really funny quote, though. I do want to read that one because there were some funny parts in this. It's a pretty sobering book. Like it's a pretty heavy book, I would say. But then there were these punchy parts of humor that were really appreciated. And um, this was one of them. So I definitely want to read this. It just had a really cool phrase of um, geriatric ninja. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so this was with Hawk saying they're talking. Um, so the quote goes, just Hawk saying he had it all worked out. Everything set. As soon as there was trouble, shoo, out the window he goes. Carlisle grins. I never knew you were keeping a geriatric ninja. So the wordplay was really fun in this book. I loved it. Mm-hmm. And I thought it really helped bring the world and the characters alive. Um, I enjoyed the banter between Carlisle and Anderson. Yeah. They were fun yeah. together. Uh-huh. Um, yeah. And, I mean, even just the whole, even when Carlisle is admonishing him later and saying, you need to relax. Here, let's get some whiskey and enjoy the, the country that we just bought. Watch the sunset a little bit. You know, and, and Anderson's so worked up. And just, and he's always teasing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I thought it was really cool um, to also think back on, I don't know, just just would this ever be a movie? Could you picture it as a movie? Oh, it would be gorgeous and devastating. Yeah. I, uh, <laughs> it would be hard to sit through. But yeah. at the same time, I want to see the, the colors that I couldn't see in the book that I know are there because they kept talking about the marigold colored robes of the Buddhist monks and all the things. But in my mind, all I kept seeing were just these drab, terrible, sad colors. But I want to see the bright colors that's like contrasted with the sadness that's going on. And, but my mind could not conjure it while I was reading it. Cause it, yeah, it is pretty heavy and everything like that. Mm -hmm. Well, there was one other quote I wanted to share and does anyone have points they'd like us to cover? Go ahead and comment on that right now as I read this last quote so that we can see those in the feed. Uh, This was just, I thought it was really compelling. Again, it goes back to, I guess I've already alluded to a lot about the character that spoke most to me and that was Amiko. But there's this scene where it's right after a horrible scene of abuse, but she is taking a shower and it just goes into so much detail about every little Mm -hmm. part of her shower. And it was so meaningful to her. And, you know, it talked about the sliver of soap and all the details. So I won't go into Mm -hmm. the whole thing. But um, I did want to read this quote. It says, at the end of her rinsing, she is happy to find a little water left in the bucket. She dips one ladle full and drinks it, gulping, and then in a wasteful, unrestrained gesture, she upends the bucket over her head in one glorious, cathartic rush. In that moment, between the touch of the water and the splash as it pools around her toes, she is clean. Mm -hmm. So I thought, I mean, not really, I got a little teary at that moment because I could just picture how valuable water was. She was always overheating. She was always abused. And she um, has this one moment where she, earlier in the passage, it talks about everything she couldn't wash off of her. But Mm -hmm. in this, like, moment of excess, like, wasting something on purpose, she found Mm -hmm. true joy and meaning. And I thought that was really interesting in an environmental book, to admit that there is part of the human spirit that finds something in excess. So... It gave me a lot to think about. I don't have any big statements about this quote or anything, but I thought it was cool that he could acknowledge, the author could acknowledge within this kind of environmental book, I call it an environmental book, um, that that there's a place for excess and how how do we keep the right boundaries around our excess? Because this wasn't some huge excess, but it, it is part of our human spirit. And I think that's, there's that tension there amid all the the things we know we should do. I don't know if that brings any thoughts to you, but. Well, it makes me think about how she was desperate for ceremony. Yeah. She needed, she, I mean, it's like she needed a ritual for herself. Yeah, and absolutely. In a world that was entrenched with religious rituals that she was not allowed to participate in. 
There yeah. was no food for her. There was, there was nothing for her. She didn't even have her own kind that she can meet with. Um, I think that that excess that you that you spoke about was necessary for a ceremony. And, you know, we see that with like a baptism in a way. And like a um, feeling of abundance. Yeah. yeah. That's a really cool yeah, link. Kind of like of the the idea of being reborn. Yeah, totally. Okay. Now, I think I saw a comment, but as I'm looking at the screen, it's possible that um, I made that up in my mind. So if you <laughs> left a comment, I am not trying to ignore you. I think actually, I think there was not a comment. I think it may have been my low battery popping up. <laughs> And I just hit my wall with my elbow. Okay. I just never know what you guys can hear, but it was pretty loud right here. <laughs> but explain well, what that fine. was. Okay. Well, <laughs> since I don't see any comments, I will be looking through the feed. If you guys think of things after the, after the fact, um, or if you have quotes that you love from this book, go ahead and post them in there. And please link to any friends. You can just type at, so, you know, the at symbol and then a person's name on the page and then it, it will uh, tag them. And so then they can decide if they want to join the group and watch things like this, if you know someone that would enjoy it. And we'll keep polishing and getting better, but thank you so much for making this such a great discussion, Jessica. And um, did you have, I feel like maybe I cut you off though in my rush. To, oh, no, seriously. Okay, good. <laughs> um, again, there's so much more. It was like, a, is it 500 pages? It was 18 hours on Audible. So my book was 350 pages. Oh, but, was it? Okay. Yeah, but the formatting was kind of large. So, okay. you know, or not, I mean, not large, small. <laughs> small, yeah. yeah. So it seemed like yeah. it was a smaller font than most books typically are. So I think it could have easily be three, 500 uh, pages for sure. Yeah. I mean, it was a dark enough book and a long enough book that I can mm -hmm. honestly say, um, it will be a while before I want to read something this in depth, but it definitely was important for me to read. And, and I thought so much mm -hmm. about my own, my own freedoms, my own footstep on the planet, obviously. And, and all that. Yeah. Good the stuff, so. was incredible. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So if you've made it through all of this and you still haven't read the book, um, hopefully it makes you excited about some of the stuff that might come up. And since most of you listening to this probably have read the book again, please feel free to post your ideas and your thoughts in the comments below. Our next read is Morlock Knight by K.W. Jeter. This is a steampunk classic. It is, in fact, by the person who coined the term steampunk. So K.W. Jeter. And it's really interesting, the history of this story. So if you even just listen to or read the intro by Tim Powers, it's really interesting that this was going to be a series of Arthurian legends. I didn't know that. But Jessica, Ooh. actually, she writes an Arthurian legend about a really awesome Guinevere. So, um, so I definitely <laughs> want to mention that and, and just point you to this other eco-punk author we have on the show here, Jessica Sundin. And you can check out her work and also check out episodes 31 and 32 of the podcast where we talk about her work and all kinds of other punk-related themes. So, uh, again, wonderful to have you. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> So that was a fun chat. <laughs> it was. And mm -hmm. I just want to say, you know, so this is the first of these recordings, uh, the Facebook live recordings. My first texting that I wanted to have happen didn't work at the last minute. So this was the second thing. And Jessica just rolled with it. It was cool. That's been the name of the game <laughs> in the last few weeks. So thank you for everyone who's starting this with me. I feel like we're all in this together. And mm -hmm. I appreciate everyone's patience and everyone's suggestions. So if you have ideas that go beyond just what we talked about today, just about how to make this better for you. Um, one thing I wanted to do was to show quotes on the screen and it just wouldn't work with this second, <laughs> this plan B that we were dealing with, with the tech, but um, I would love to do that. If you have any other ideas, don't be shy. Feel free to give me those suggestions or tell me how else I can help you with the stuff you're working on and doing. So again, thank you for your time, Jessica. Thank you <laughs> and, for having me. This is so fun yeah. as usual. Absolutely. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> again, two weeks and we'll be reading our next read. And that should be it. Any questions? I think Jessica's going to drop off, but I'll stay online for any questions. 
and feel free to <laughs> shoot those my way. Bye, Jessica. Bye, everyone. Okay, story punks, what did you think? I know it was rocky at times, I'll just readily admit that, but I also think it came together so well for the first version of this reading room, this book club that's virtual and you can watch it in real time at 8 p.m. Central every other Monday, or you can watch the replays. For now, I will also be posting these episodes to the podcast, unless I hear, you know, kicking and screaming, because I think there are people that that access this stuff best through audio. And I totally understand that. I love audio myself. And in fact, as mentioned, Audible is sponsoring both of these episodes of the Story Punks podcast. So I'm really excited to connect you to Audible if it could be a life changer for you, if it could help you read a lot of the books that we're going over in this salon. So again, you can find the full list of reads at storypunks.world forward slash salon. I also have it posted in the Facebook group. So you find the group by going to facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash story punks. Most of all, I hope you are just rocking it when it comes to anything you are developing or creating. And we're heading into summer that's so exciting. And I hope it's a creative summer and that you are able to get some traction and really get some things done. That's always the challenge and what I'm always trying to do over here. So I'm with you and I'm sending you good vibes. Have a wonderful week.